Hi, Hi everybody. Uh, indeed, I'm Jason, and thanks a lot uh, to the organizers and the program committee uh, for putting the paper on the program. It's really a pleasure to be here. So I'll talk to you about this joint work with Denny Grom and Georgia Pitentino, and Georgia is here, indeed called Conflicting Priorities, a Theory of Covenants and Collateral. So this is a paper about the different kinds of debt that firms have, in particular about debt protected by covenants and debt backed by collateral. So it's a paper about debt structure, not capital structure, but we think in fact the debt versus debt decision might be even more important than the debt versus equity decision. After all, nine out of 10 times when firms raise finance, they do it with debt. But the debt they do it with is not all the same. And let me start with some facts about that. So firms rely on different types of debt at once, including secured debt, debt backed by collateral, and unsecured debt, debt not backed by collateral, debt with covenants, and debt without covenants. But these different types of debt are not all treated the same in the event of default. They're prioritized. Some get paid first and others get paid later. And secured debt has what's called absolute priority. It's supposed to be paid in full before anything else gets paid at all, at least up to the value of the collateral. So if I borrow from Gregor, unsecured, and then I take secured debt to Adriano, but Adriano gets paid first even though he came second. And as a result, Gregor might want some protection against that dilution by the with the secured debt I take to Adriano. Right? And indeed, unsecured debt has covenants limiting this dilution by limiting the issuance of new secured debt. These are called negative pledge covenants, and they're a very common covenant. Just for example, they're in 44% of the loan contracts in Billy King and Maurer's sample. And if I borrow from Gregor with such a covenant and then violate it by taking the secure debt to Adriano, Gregor has the right to accelerate his debt and demand immediate repayment. Right? So, uh, so, however, despite this acceleration right, lawyers' view on these negative pledge covenants, and they're the main people I think have been talking about them, is actually pretty negative. Right? Why? Well, let me just try to explain it to you with a quote from what we think is a really great law paper by this guy, Bier. He says, negative pledge covenants may be of little practical comfort. Why? Because the secured party, that's Adriano, whose presence violates the covenant, is entitled to repayment from the collateral even before the injured pre the negative pledgee. That's Gregor. Right? So, in, so he goes on, he says, the covenant does not prevent third parties, Adriano's, from acquiring a security interest, but is merely a hollow promise. For in the very act of breaching the covenant, right, the borrower that's me, I place my assets out of reach of Gregor the negative plenty and into Adriano's hands. And all that Gregor can do right, as, uh, to undo this is try to uh, claim against me by accelerating. But, this leads another, but even if he accelerates, he can't get his hands on the assets, and this leads another lawyer called Han to say, in the case of a debtor indebted to secured creditors, acceleration by unsecured creditors seems somewhat futile. And this leads to the questions that we address in this paper, starting with basically, if negative pledge covenants are so useless, why are they so used? Right? So why did borrowers rely so heavily on negative pledge covenants, especially when they have another instrument, secured debt, that isn't so useless? Why don't they just rely on secured debt in the first place to promise priority credibly? And let me stress that it's not that, oh, I first, firms in practice first exhaust their secured debt capacity and then start using negative pledge covenants as a second best solution. Right? They use unsecured debt and unsecured debt with negative pledge covenants even when they have assets available that they could use as collateral for secured debt. Right? So there's not a pecking order. Right? Then we are, but even though there's not a pecking order, of course, borrowers do use secure debt as one part of this multi-tiered debt structure. So why do they use this multi-tiered debt structure? Why do they use what seems to be an interior mix of secured and unsecured debt and debt with and without negative pledge covenants? So we're going to try to address these questions uh, in this paper in a model of sequential financing based on two frictions. So the first friction is just limited pledgeability. I can't borrow against my project's full present value. That gives a role that, to the possibility that I could be inefficiently financially constrained. The second friction is that contracts are non-exclusive. Right? So when I write this contract with Gregor, although I'm allowing a, a clause that says I can't pledge collateral to Adriano, I don't have an ankle bracelet that electrocutes me if I try to take out a pen and sign such a contract anyway. As a result, there's the possibility that I can sign conflicting contracts. And the, role of collateral in, so, and the role of collateral in this paper is going to be exactly to establish priority among these contracts. Once contracts can conflict, I need a priority rule, and that's what collateral does here. 
Notice the collateral doesn't affect the limited pledgeability friction. That's a, a role of collateral that's been emphasized a lot in the papers and a lot in the literature, notably in Adriano's papers. We switch that off entirely and focus in, on how collateral uh, mitigates the non-exclusivity friction, which is arguably its main role legally. In particular, we'll assume that secured debt has absolute priority over assets used as collateral. As a result, if I have unsecured debt to Gregor and I pledge my assets to Adriano as collateral, this new secured debt dilutes the existing unsecured debt I have to Gregor. And this is a paper all about dilution. Right? But dilution here has two sides. It has one side that you might be quite used to, which is that dilution can be bad. Why? Because it can lead to overinvestment. When I have a new investment, I finance it with secure debt from Adriano. We're basically expropriating value from the unsecured creditors uh, from Gregor, and as a result, subsidizing the new investment. New investments are subsidized at the expense of existing creditors. I haven't signed up to overinvest. However, it has another side, which you may be less used to, which is that dilution can be good. Why? Because it can prevent underinvestment. It loosens borrowing constraints that could be too tight due to the first friction of limited pledgeability. Right, so this is a paper about trying to choose the optimal debt structure that allows good dilution but blocks bad dilution. So it's a trade-off theory of debt structure that trades off the flexibility of uh, unsecured debt that allows me to do good dilution right, with the commitment of secure debt which prevents bad dilution. And this trade-off is going to underlie all of our main results, so let me try to give you a helicopter view of what those are. So first, I'll just show you that secure debt can't block bad dilution. That's almost by definition. So unsecured debt can't block bad dilution. That's almost by definition, right? Secure debt has absolute priority. This leads to overinvestment, as I hinted at. So you think, oh, how can I block bad dilution? I just use secure debt, no problem. Well, indeed, secure debt blocks bad dilution. But of course, maybe it, might, it can block it too much because we might need to do good dilution to implement efficiency. And that leads to underinvestment, or what we call a collateral overhang problem. So the main thing in this paper is to see how negative pledge covenants can help. Even though maybe they don't do what they're supposedly supposed to do, they do allow for dilution, right? but the acceleration threat deters some of this dilution. If I anticipate Gregor's going to accelerate, force repayment, force me to liquidate, maybe I don't want to violate the covenant. However, the puzzle that the lawyers are talking about is not, oh, why am I deterred by acceleration? The puzzle is, why is that acceleration threat ever credible, given that acceleration is futile to reverse dilution by new secured debt? Right? And indeed, I'll show you that if Gregor's the only unsecured creditor, he's never going to accelerate because Adriano's going to have all the assets and he has nothing to gain. So maybe the lawyers are not so dumb. Right? What I'll show you, though, is that if we choose a richer debt structure, where Gregor's not the only unsecured creditor, but maybe Stain is another unsecured creditor, but without negative pledge covenants, <coughs> right? then by accelerating, Gregor can get his money out, not reversing the acceleration I've done uh, by pledging my assets to Adriano, but he can get some money out ahead of the repayments I owe Stain. His debt, I pay Gregor before Stain's debt even becomes due. In other words, the option to accelerate embeds an option to dilute, not to undo dilution, but to dilute other unsecured debt. And if this option is valuable at the right time, this acceleration threat can be credible at the right time. Right? And, the right, and the correct debt structure can implement efficiency even under the current priority rule. Right? So we think that matters for policy because lawyers have been advocating relaxing the current priority or relaxing the absolute priority of secured debt. So in an influential paper, Bebchuk and Fried, they say this article challenges the desirability of full priority of secured claims. And their argument is basically secured debt has too much power to dilute unsecured debt. We should relax it. And we agree. Such proposals do protect against dilution. But what we, uh, want, what we suggest, maybe it protects against dilution too much. And in fact, we show that the existing priority rules right, can be efficient, implement efficiency, if firms choose the right mix of debt with those priority rules in the background. And it seems like they might be doing something like choosing this right mix of debt because we think our results resonate with practice. In particular, we explain why negative pledge covenants are pervasive despite uh, lawyers saying they're useless. Right? You need to do good dilution but block, per, deter bad dilution. We explain why covenants are frequently violated or waived because in order to do good dilution, that covenant needs to be relaxed. Right? Now, if you allow me a bit more of a stretch of the interpretation, I think we can also speak to why covenant use increases in growth opportunities. We think growth firms are the ones that are most likely to want to do innovative things that have low pledgeability, so they're more likely to value flexibility a lot relative to commitment, right? which is what co covenants provide and secure debt doesn't. On the other hand, we think we can explain why distressed firms maybe are more likely to use secure debt 
they're more likely to suffer from bad agency problems, right? They want to do asset stripping, asset substitution, self-dealing, tunneling, whatever, right? And therefore, they value the commitment afforded by secure debt more than the flexibility afforded by unsecured debt with covenants. So that's where we're going. Before we go there, let me just say two words about where we fit into the literature. So we fit into the set of models in which collateral is there mainly to establish priority. Right? So, and the only paper that we know of that really focuses on negative pledge covenants is this paper by Iotam Bolton. Uh, Peter's presidential address also focuses on this. And that sort of, although, although it didn't get a lot of attention for a while, it goes all the way back to Stalls and Johnson. Uh, that's about how uh, using secure debt can uh, solve the debt overhang problem. A big difference with that is that this is not renegotiation proof, unlike the collateral overhang problem that we focus on. Uh, oh, and another thing that, that I should just read the bullet is that uh, the fo they focus on priority in bankruptcy. Here we also have an important role for collateral outside bankruptcy, and that's something we certainly don't have in our other paper. And it also fits into models of covenants. Most of these focus on debt versus equity conflicts, not debt versus debt conflicts. Okay. So let me, uh, that's where we're going. Uh, now let me try to take you there. I'll give you a simplified version of the model. It gives all the results, but it's just not fully closed. So I'm going to be doing comparative statics on things that are endogenous uh, in, the, in the full version. All right, so let me start with the bar. That's me and my end project. So I have assets A in place and debt F0 in place. So I'm just going to think, okay, this is the debt to Gregor. Does it have covenants? Is it unsecured? Is it secured? And see what I can implement efficiency. So I can invest in a project. It costs A plus I, and it has a quality Q, which can be either H for high or L for low. And it succeeds and pays off XQ plus YQ with probability P, and otherwise it pays off zero. So what is this X and Y? Well, X is the pledgeable part of the output. That's all the stuff that can be seized by my creditors. And Y is not pledgeable, so the simplest thing to think about is just pure private benefits. It goes straight in my belly, but it still matters for welfare. But more generally, it should be a stand-in for anything that's entrepreneur-specific, things that maybe are more, so the part of the product is more valuable uh, if I'm the one running it, if you like Hardin Moore type of micro-foundations. Uh, now, that's what happens if I carry the project through to maturity. If I don't carry it through to maturity, Y is destroyed. That's inefficient. I can liquidate for P times X. So what's P times X? That's the expected pledgeable part of the cash flow, which is what a competitive buyer is willing to pay knowing that he can't capture the Y. So I think I just sell in a competitive market. Right. Now, I can finance these projects with a combination uh, of three instruments, secured debt, unsecured debt, or unsecured debt with negative pledge covenants. Now, I don't have to make any ad hoc restrictions to these three instruments, but I'll show you that these three are enough. Right, so what are they? Uh, secured debt is a promise to repay with some amount we'll call FSEC, secured by the projects as collateral. Unsecured debt is a promise to repay without collateral, and unsecured debt with negative pledge covenants is also a promise without collateral, right? but it comes with the option to accelerate if I violate the covenant and borrow secured. Right? Now, I told you that contracts were non-exclusive and could potentially conflict, and as a result, I need to specify a priority rule for how these uh, conflicts among these contracts are resolved. So this priority rule that we specify is exactly like just trying to copy what's used in practice. Right? So in particular, secured debt has priority over any assets used as collateral. Right? And this means something very strong. It means something stronger than we realized when we started working on this paper, right? and we'd already worked on this topic a bit. Uh, so it's paid ahead. what does it mean? It means it's paid ahead of all unsecured debt. That's just the absolute priority rule. It means that it's paid ahead of any later uh, uh, secured debt. So the first liens are paid ahead of second liens. That's a first-in-time rule for secured debt. Uh, but it also means that it's paid ahead of any other claimants if collateral is liquidated or sold. So if I have a mortgage on my house and I sell it, right, the uh, mortgage, which one is it? The mortgagee has a claim on the house ahead of the buyer. Right. So how do we capture this? If I liquidate assets, I have to pay off my mortgage. If I want to sell my house to pay my credit card, I have to pay my mortgage first. Unsecured debt, on the other hand, is just pro rata in the event of default. Acceler um, so acceler but acceleration can give effective priority over other unsecured debt. If Stain's debt's not due yet and Gregor accelerates, I pay Gregor first. Stain has a claim on me later on. Right. However, by acceler Gre Gregor does not get a claim over secured debt by accelerating because I can't you know, sell my house to pay him. Gre uh, Adriano has that claim. Right. So uh, that's the setup. Uh, we're going to solve the model under two parameter restrictions. The first one is that a project is positive NPV if it's high quality and negative NPV if it's low quality. What do I mean? Well, the expected total cash flow, P times X, the pledgeable part, plus Y, the non-pledgeable part in state H, is higher than the cost of the investment A plus I, is, is higher than the expected total cash flow in the uh, 
for the low quality project. Right? Notice this includes this Y part, which could be private benefits, or it could be because I need liquidity in distress. Right? And the second is that the project is not self financing. What do I mean? Well, the expected pledgeable part, only no Y, is less than the cost of the project. And that means I might have to dilute my existing debt in order, uh, my existing debt in order to finance the new project. Right? So this is where I might need some good dilution. So the second project, the second assumption is not there. It's not necessary to solve the model. It's just there uh, uh, to sort of focus on within the most novel or interesting cases. And the first assumption, of course, is just there to give us clean benchmarks, starting with the first best. So what's the first best? Well, I invest in a project if and only if it has positive NPV. So I invest in uh, the high quality project and not in the low quality project. Hopefully that's obvious. I'm going to belabor it even more and sort of say, what are the two things that are necessary for the first best? All right. First, it has to be that I don't invest in the low quality project. Well, there could be a problem, though, because remember, non-exclusivity can lead to overinvestment. When I borrow from Adriano, uh, right, I'm subsidizing my new investment. It can lead to overinvestment. My borrowing constraints could be too loose. I might need to block bad dilution. Right? On the other hand, it, can be, it has to be that I can invest in Q equals H. I get to do this high-quality project. And there, there's also a problem in doing that, which is that limited pledgeability can lead to underinvestment. Right? My borrowing constraints could be too tight, so I need to do good dilution. For the rest of the talk, I'm just going to run through the possible instruments, unsecured debt, secured debt, and unsecured debt with negative pledge covenants, and say, which instrument gives me enough commitment not to do the low quality project, but still enough flexibility that I can do the high one. So let's start with unsecured debt. Well, here we get immediately to our first frame result, which I sort of already told, well, I've told you them all, I guess, but, which is that there's an inefficiency of unsecured debt. Right? What is it? Well, if I borrow from Gregor, so take F0 completely unsecured, I can dilute. And that leads to this overinvestment in the low quality project because we have too much bad dilution. Now, how do we block this bad dilution? Well, I just say you secured debt to Adriano. Oh, sorry, to Gregor in the first place, so I can't dilute with new secured debt to Adriano. So what happens if I so let's let's what hap, to see what happens, let's suppose that I borrow F0 secured from Gregor. And there could be some other uh, unsecured debt also to Gregor. So my secured debt, this F0 set, cannot be diluted. Right? But any unsecured part of his debt can be. Right? So the question is, what's my debt capacity? Because right? I want to have enough debt capacity that I can invest in H, but not enough. So my debt capacity is the most I can borrow, which is, of course, secured, because secured debt allows me the, to borrow the most. So what I can promise Adriano, my new secured creditor, everything that I haven't already promised to Gregor secured. Because the new secured debt is paid ahead of the earlier unsecured debt, so I can just promise that stuff to Adriano. That's the absolute priority rule. But it's paid after earlier unsecured debt. That's the first in time rule. First mortgages are, are paid ahead of second mortgages. So what's my debt capacity? Well, with probability P, I get some stuff. I get X, which is pledgeable, which can go to my creditors. And uh, Adriano gets everything I haven't already promised secured to Gregor with F06. No, I'm, I'm, I'm already on results, so I should tell you. So, so <laughs> the timing is, first, I uh, write contracts. Uh, I, I mean, so for this uh, simplified thing, I have some debt in place with uh, Gregor. I, HRL is revealed. I try to borrow, I borrow from Adriano. He lends me or not. And then uh, that's basically it. Then the cash flows are, are realized. Debt is settled. OK, so what do I need? I need the debt capacity to be enough that I'm constrained in one state or the other. So when is first best implementable with just secured debt or a mix of secured and unsecured debt to Gregor? Well, it's implemented if I'm constrained if Q equals L, but not if Q equals H. So to be constrained when Q equals L, my debt capacity, this is the expression I just showed you, with X equals L has to be less than the investment cost. But to be unconstrained when Q equals H, uh, it has to be that my debt capacity is greater than the investment cost. Right, well, just rearranging, we see that I can find such an amount of secured debt to Gregor whenever XL is less than XH. And that's our second main result, which is that secure debt implements the first best when if XH, the pledgeable fraction of the high quality project is high. Right, so, so what's the reason so, or the result? I think financing the project requires dilution. So keep that in mind. And I can't finance it if all my debt's secured. So what do I do? I have to reduce the amount of secured debt to allow for some dilution. But remember, I could allow for too much dilution. Right? So if, X, oops, if XL is less than XH, then I can find F0 sec so that I can fund it, the high quality project and not the low one, because less dilution is needed to fund H than L. Okay. 
So great. In this case, when XH is high, we're sorted, and we don't need these covenants. However, what if we need to dilute more to fund the H quality product and the L quality product? What could this mean? I, I, you know, I, I have sort of this running example of a hotel in my mind. I've got this hotel, and I can either you know, build another like, crappy redeployable building, right, or I can turn it into a design hotel. Now, either one of those things could be the efficient thing socially, but almost surely the design hotel is less pledgeable than uh, the extra building that can be redeployed. Right? So you think, okay, what, it, what about the case when the high quality thing is the design hotel and the low quality thing is the extra building? Well, in that case, we get under investment secured debt. So to see that, suppose we need more dilution to fund the H project than the L1, so XH less than XL. Then any amount of secured debt I give to Gregor that blocks my, me from doing the L project blocks me from doing the H project too. Right? So secured borrowing blocks future positive NPV projects. And this really resonates with practitioners' intuition. So I've, we've used this quote a lot. So, so what happens is secured borrowing encumbers assets. So this is a quote from Deloitte. They say, asset encumbrance not only poses risks to unsecured creditors. That's the dilution we've been talking about so far. I encumber my assets by pledging them to Adriano, and that's a risk to Gregor. But it also has wider implications since encumbered assets are generally not available to obtain liquidity. If I encumber my assets, I can't get enough new liquidity to get through distress or to fund my design hotel. Right? In other words, there's what we call a collateral overhang. So, and we show that unlike, by the way, the debt overhang problem, this collateral overhang is renegotiation proof. So renegotiation could not solve the problem, but I will skip that. And ask, can we solve it instead with negative pledge covenants? Right? So just to ask this question, let's suppose that I have F0 unsecured with negative pledge covenants to Gregor. And ask what happens if I violate the covenant taking on secure debt FSEC to Adriano. And for the purposes of the presentation, let's focus on this case when FSEC is sufficiently large. Okay. In that case, creditors Gregor has the option to accelerate forcing liquidation. Right? So if I anticipate acceleration, I won't violate the covenant because that's going to get rid of all my why, destroying something that's really valuable to me. So again, the, pro the question is not, oh, why would I not violate the covenant if I anticipate acceleration? It's why would Gre Gregor ever accelerate? So is the acceleration threat credible? Well, yes, it's credible if what? If Gregor gets more from accelerating than continuing. <clears throat> what does he get if he accelerates? Well, if he accelerates, remember, I've got to pay Adriano first before I can pay Gregor. I have to liquidate my assets. I sell in the market at the competitive price. That's PX, the expected pledgeable part. And I pay Adriano off the top, and Gregor can get, what, get what's left. Right? On the other hand, if I, can, if I continue, what does Gregor get? Well, the probability P, my thing pays off. And I get X, it goes to all the creditors, but again, Adriano gets paid off the top. And what can you see? This is never satisfied. Why? Because here I'm subtracting F, and here I'm subtracting just P times F. Right? Why is it never satisfied? Because acceleration makes secure debt safer, because the secure debt is paid first out of the liquidation value. When Gregor makes me liquidate, that means Adriano gets paid for sure. That's a subsidy to secure debt and a tax on the very debt that's being accelerated. So of course, Gregor won't accelerate to avoid this tax. Right? In other words, covenants don't discipline, and we get exactly the same outcome as we would have got without covenants. Right, so here we're back to the lawyer, and you say you wrote this thing just to like, justify this like, quote at the beginning. I mean, so maybe that seems smart. But that's not quite the whole story. Why? Because in practice, it's not that all debt has negative pledge covenants. Only a fraction of debt has these covenants. And also these covenants are commonly carved out. That's the Ivashina and Ballet paper. So let's ask what happens if only a fraction phi of the debt with negative pledge covenants is uh, <coughs> of the unsecured debt, sorry, ha I said it wrong. If only a fraction phi of the debt that's unsecured has negative pledge covenants and the rest is unsecured. So there's phi uh, to Gregor with negative pledge and one minus phi to stain without the negative pledge. Then ask for this phi less than one, so not all the debt with the covenants, is the acceleration threat credible? And the answer is yes. Yes, if what? Well, again, if the acceleration value is greater than the continuation value. What's the acceleration value? Well, it's exactly the same thing. Gregor accelerates. I have to liquidate. I've got to pay Adriano. So I liquidate. I pay Adriano off the top. Stain's not in the picture yet because his debt's not due, and I just have to pay what I can to Gregor. That's it. On the other hand, what happens if Gregor lets me continue? I continue, right? Okay, with P, I get X, right? and then I pay Adriano off the top, but then all of the unsecured debt is due, both Gregor's and Stain's, right? And so Gregor only gets a fraction phi of the payoff. So you see if phi is small, this can be satisfied. So acceleration is credible if phi is low. 
if the proportion of debt with the covenants is sufficiently small. Now, acceleration doesn't undo the harm of dilution with secured debt. F, Adriano is getting paid first in either case. FSEC is always getting paid first. Right? However, it gives Gregor the benefit of diluting the other unsecured debt of diluting stain. Right? So we see that there's yet another side of dilution. There's not just this good and bad dilution with collateral. There's also dilution of un unsecured debt with other unsecured debt via shorter maturity, and that's there to make the acceleration thread credible. <clears throat> and if it's credible at the right times or in the right state of nature, it could lead me to do the efficient investment policy. Right. So when is that? Well, if is the first best implementable with negative pledge covenants? Well, yes, it's implemented if acceler the acceleration thread is credible in state, uh, if it's low quality, the project is low quality, but not if it's high quality. So if Q is equal to L, it has to be that Gregor prefers to accelerate given the violation. So with XL on both sides, his acceleration value has to be greater than his continuation value. But if Q is equal to H, it has to be that he doesn't accelerate given the violation. So in this case, if X equals X to H, his acceleration value has to be less. Those are just the same uh, expressions from the previous slides. So when can I satisfy, when can I find phi, a fraction of debt to give to Gregor, such that both of these inequalities are satisfied at the same time? Well, I can find such a phi if XL is greater than XH, right? And that's our third main result. The covenants can implement the first best if XH is low, right? And notice that this is exactly the complement of when secure debt implements the first best. So I can implement first best always, for, in the, so for our setup anyway, for all the parameters. However, how I choose my debt structure, whether I favor covenants and flexibility or commitment and collateral more, depends on the kinds of projects I'm going to have in the future. Right, so specifically, if good so what happens here is if good dilution is large relative to bad, that's when XH is less than XL, I can find such a phi to implement first best. And what happens in equilibrium, well, I don't invest if Q equals L. And in that case, the covenant is upheld and it deters dilution or would be upheld. Right? And I invest if Q equals H, and in that case, the covenant is waived, right? So I, I ask Gregor, uh, uh, I either violate or ask, uh, for me, so there's no difference, as Adriano pointed out, by the way, in a discussion he gave, there's no difference between forgiveness and permission here. The covenant is waived, and that allows me to dilute with new debt. Right. Adriano, the, the professor, not the character in my presentation. Okay, uh, so, and what's the reason for this is that Gregor's acceleration is less attractive for large dilution. Okay, let me try to give you the intuition. So it has to be that Gregor doesn't accelerate when dilution is large, which for these parameters is in the case in a high quality state. Right? So to see this, think, realize that after covenants are violated, Gregor's debt is endogenously junior. Right? So the bit of Latin for that is ipso facto from reading these law papers. So he's ipso facto junior. He's paid after the secure debt, after uh, Adriano, but ahead of equity. I still have the residual claim. So his claim is both debt-like and equity-like. Now, equity has a bias toward continuation, and debt has a bias toward liquidation, and that's a general thing. So when, uh, right, so it has to be that his, the equity-likeness uh, is, is uh, dominating in the A state, and the debt-likeness is dominating in the L state. What do I mean? Well, his, he's more equity-like if dilution is large because he's closer to a residual claim. And remember, equity is just a call option on the assets, so he doesn't want to exercise this option. He doesn't want to accelerate and liquidate early in this case, which is the, which is the H quality case uh, right now. He prefers to gamble for resurrection like a firm in distress. All right, so that's the, uh, the, those are the main results. Let me skip this. And let me ask you, let me just go to a uh, comment about how covenants are priced. So we know that empirically covenants are valuable, so uh, including Gregor's paper and some other papers. And here they're valuable too because, at least in, for some parameters, with covenants, right, I do the project if Q equals H, but not if Q equals L. But what's maybe surprising is that unsecured debt with and without covenants is priced equally. Right? So Gregor and Stain have debt that has the same interest rate. And this might be surprising because you think, well, Stain is there anticipating Gregor's diluting him and is getting screwed over, so he should demand a higher interest rate because of that. But that's not what happens because this acceleration is an off equilibrium threat, but it disciplines me. It disciplines. So all the unsecured creditors, including Stain, benefit from this credible threat. So Stain actually prefers to give Gregor the option to dilute him because then I don't do this shady stuff and hurt them both. Right? And this seems to be consistent with this paper by Bradley and Roberts. They find that covenants and firms' loans 
uh, reduce the yields on their bonds. Right? So the same for adding covenants to one claim seems to improve the uh, price of the, increase the price of the other. So with that, let me return to the questions that I started with. So why, are negative, why do I use negative pledge covenants instead of just relying on secured debt? Right? And the answer is that it will give is that secured debt can protect too much against dilution. I need to maintain the flexibility to do good dilution. Why do borrowers use this multi-tier debt structure? Well, it allows the good dilution, but still protects, allows me to commit not to do the bad dilution. So to conclude, covenants can be violated and contracts can conflict. So we need a priority resol to resolve these conflicts. Lawyers, however, argue that the current priority rule is perverse, but we show it can actually help implement efficiency via the right debt structure. And this debt structure we find is multi-tiered, it's really rich, and we think realistic. Thank you.